Folks, there is an incredible opportunity in the stock market right now. One of the most obvious stocks, in, in my opinion, in the market that's facing everybody is one of the biggest steel deals in this market right now. And I haven't talked about this stock on the channel in quite some time. And um, I, I'm telling you, this stock is like stealing money right now, nonetheless, folks. And so I'm going to share that with you, an easy money stock. Uh, actually, we're going to talk about two easy money stocks in this video. But there's one main one we're going to get into later on in this video that I think uh, I need to draw to everybody's attention and explain why this stock is such easy money and why I believe the stock's actually going to appreciate between 100 and 150 percent over the next 12 to 18 months regardless regardless of what happens in the market and um, so we'll talk about that and actually that's not even a stock this isn't even a stock I personally own so don't think I'm just like you know hyping out one of my own stocks or something like that although I am actually going to potentially build out a nice size position in this one okay we're going to talk about Corsair earnings in this in this video I know a lot of people want to talk about Corsair earnings so we're going to talk about those what's going on with that stock it just hit a new 52 week high we'll talk about that my my biggest dividend position in my dividends only account reported earnings that stock went up substantially we'll speak about what happened there busy video a lot to talk about even some macroeconomic things like i said man this is just a beast video that's why i had to pour myself a, an iced tea for this one because i'm like man this is this is a beast of a video and and you know i'd rather just record one big video than break it up into separate videos on this channel i'm like let's just cover it all one time and um and, and those sorts of things okay we actually want to start today's video before we get into all these individual stocks and things in the market i'm looking at and whatnot okay is I just want to speak about Wall Street for a moment, okay? This is Wall Street. That picture I got for you right there, that is Wall Street, okay? These folks follow each other around constantly. And I think it's important that we understand how Wall Street works and we understand that... Although you think these people are really smart, they just follow each other around. And whatever the trend is at that time, they go for that trend. And it's proven out time and time again, okay? Just look at the past three years. I don't even want to go through the past 15 years of me being in the market. Just in the past three years, these people follow each other around and they do whatever they're all doing at the same exact time. 2020, what was it? We're selling everything, right? We had the fastest stock market crash in the history of the stock market. The S&P 500 went down something like 34 35% in a matter of weeks, not in months, not in years, in weeks, right? And, and they couldn't sell stocks fast enough. It was out of everything, right? Then fast forward 2021, it's everything to the moon, right? Like, like, you know, people blame retail for pushing up the whole entire stock market and, you know, all those stocks to sky. You think that was retail doing that? You think retail had the money to, to you know, pump these $10 billion, $100 billion market caps to the sky? No, okay? That was Wall Street. Retail was just the cherry on top of that whole situation, right? So then it was in everything, the, the, the moon, you know, we got to be in the riskiest, high growth, everything, okay? Then 2022, right? It was sell everything. Sell NVIDIA, sell AMD, sell Meta, sell, sell Tesla, sell Amazon, right? It didn't matter what it was. 40% down wasn't enough. 50% down wasn't enough. 60% down wasn't enough. 70% down wasn't enough. There were still people when Meta was under $90 a share that didn't think, you know, oh, it's got to go even lower, right? Insanity, right? And they were talking about, you know, throughout the summer, and I would react to this on my reaction channel, they would talk about, oh, you know, natural gas, oil, got to be a natural gas, got to be an oil. They were talking about this in the summertime, in the fall time of 2022. Look what has happened to the price of oil and natural gas. <laughs> and... and just as I knew it was, it was going to play out like that, it played out exactly that way, right? These folks flood into these things. And then by the, by the time, you, you know, they're, they're talking about it on CNBC constantly, everybody's already positioned there. There's only nothing but downside at that point in time, right? And then 2023, what has it been? Oh, let's load back up on all these stocks we decided to sell out of six to nine months ago, right? NVIDIA, AMD, Meta, Tesla. Like, look at all the moves of these stocks since the, the end of uh, 2022 versus now. It's incredible, right? And so that's Wall Street at the end of the day, folks. These folks follow each other around. They jump off the cliff together, and then they all go one way. And it's just it cracks me up, man. It cracks me up. But it is what it is, okay? Corsair Gaming CRSR. It's been an interesting past few years for Corsair Gaming. So this stock just hit a new 52-week high. At this point in time, this was one of those stocks that just couldn't get out of its own way. It was all the way down to the $10 range back about nine months ago or so. Nine months ago was about a $10 stock. And so obviously it's come back substantially. It's now at a 52 week high in regards to Corsair. And the thing I think is important to understand about a stock like this, right? Because you're seeing the stock and you're like, wow, 52 week high for Corsair? And I, I know it is kind of shocking when you hear that, like a stock at 52 week highs. Well, other stocks still haven't even bottomed yet. Some stocks are at 52 week lows right now. It's a confusing market, right? It's not like, you know, when you see 52 week high, you're expecting a bunch of other stocks. And actually we don't have that many stocks at 52 week high right now. 
But you've got to remember with Corsair, this was in the first group of stocks to start falling in 2021, right? This stock peaked in February of 2021. That was its, that was its peak. And then from there, it just fell and fell and fell and fell all the way to obviously the bottom back in April of uh, 2022, right? So it was over a year and a half of just pain in that stock, right? And as somebody that's been an investor of that stock, it was a lot of pain to go through. And I thought I got really good pricing because most of my shares I was buying was in the $20 range, right? And I even got some, you know, 18, 17, 16 dollars, and then all of a sudden it's at 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, and I'm like, wow, <laughs> I paid, I guess, a bad price for the stock, right? And so this was part of the first group to fall, and now it's for you know part of the first group to um, come back. Let's put it that way, okay? So what happened here with the numbers? Were these numbers good? Were these numbers bad? All those sorts of things, okay? The numbers were a mixed bag, in my opinion, okay? So here's how I left it, and I posted this actually in the breadcrumbs tab inside the Discord chat. I said, Corsair looks to be at the very early stages of turning around. Uh, when gamer and creator peripherals get back on track, hopefully the back half this year, that should turn more obvious in terms of the turnaround for this company. And you can see this very clear in the numbers, right? If you look at the gamer and creator peripherals, that, that's down significantly year over year, right? 134 mil in the same quarter last year, 88 mil in this most current quarter, right? Gaming components and systems, very strong, 265 versus 246 in the same quarter last year, right? Margins, as far as gamer and creator peripherals, down, but you look at now components and systems, margins have started to go up and up pretty nicely, right? From 19.3% to 22.2%, and uh, total gross margins have started to improve now at this point in time. So a stock like this is, it, it's, um, it, it's becoming... To me, it's becoming evident that the start of the turnaround has happened in Corsair, okay? This stock is not in full turnaround mode. It's not like it's obvious. Once revenues start trending back up again, and then you get net income to start trending in a major way back, right? We are starting to see, uh, you know... Uh, it trend somewhat in the right direction in terms of net loss, right? But once this goes back positive, which should be very shortly here, it's in like the next quarter or two, and once you see the revenues really start to ramp up and get back to growth, that's the moment that the turnaround is then obvious, okay? Right now, you're at the beginning stages of like, oh, this looks like it's starting to turn, okay? Now, why is the stock at a 52-week uh, high, you know, before it's clear as far as a turnaround? When it comes to these turnaround stocks, as the turn becomes more and more evident and more and more clear, you're going to have more and more folks start to flood money in and to start to pile money in and more and more Wall Street funds, more and more investors in general start to pile in. And by the time the turn's obvious and the revenues are up, the, the company's back to profitability, everything's great again. By that time, the stock's already run huge, right? And by that time, Corsair is probably going to be, I would guess, 25 to $35 a share, somewhere in there roughly. By the time the turnaround is clear and it's like, oh, they made it. They, they fully turned this business around. Everything's headed in the right directions. The margins, they're back to profits. They're back to positive net income, positive EPS every single quarter. They're back to growing revenues and all those sorts of things, okay? So that's what you're seeing play out now at this point in time. The the bottom, obviously, was the fall of 2022 in terms of kind of the, the ugliness of like, wow, are they actually gonna be able to ever turn this around? And then as these you know last few quarters have happened, it seems more and more evident that the turnaround is here, okay? And it's actually happening, right? So that's Corsair Gaming. Uh, I'm, I'm a happy shareholder of Corsair. I'm still down in the position. I believe I'll be up on the position very nicely before it's all said and done. But um, nonetheless, that's where we're at with Corsair. It's been, it was a grind, man. It was a, it was a tough, certainly a tough time in Corsair for quite a bit there, right? Estelle. So Estel, no man's land right now, right? This is one of many hedges I have on the market, right? A hedge meaning essentially like, you know, I'm, I'm positioned long in the market, right? So... I, obviously, I'm super heavy into all these long positions, the Metas and the Teslas and all the other stocks I own, right? So I need to save some face somewhere if the market's to tank in any major way, right? So one of many hedges I have is SDAO, which is basically 3x uh, working against the market on a, on, a, on a daily basis, essentially, for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Now, it's in no man's land right now because we're in a confusing time where we're, we're, we're not getting a clear signal one way or another, okay? And so this is something I positioned into back in December 2022 as just one of a few hedges I have in the market, right? Now, in terms of what could spike SDAO and in terms of spike SDAO, you know, really, really get SDAO to start going up, okay? And obviously get the Dow Jones Industrial Average to go down. There's a few potentials here. One is debt ceiling. I, I don't... I don't know if that's really going to freak people out. There's a lot of people that are really worried about that, including Jamie Dimon. There's a lot of folks that are really concerned about debt ceiling and that causing panic in the market. I don't know if we're really going to get that. However, it is a potential, okay? 
If we got clear indicators that we're in recession, going to recession, and you know things were to get ugly or something like that, that could be something that certainly spikes the uh, S Dow and obviously tanks the Dow Jones Industrial Average. If we get a, a like a more serious bank going under, okay, something you know it can't be SVB or or you know First Republic or some of these guys that a lot of people weren't even familiar with before a few weeks ago. We need something serious to go under. If some real big, I don't know, a Schwab or like um. Oh, gosh, a U.S. bank corp, like something just crazy that I was like, wow, that big, huge financial institution went under. If we got something like that, that would obviously tank the market in a substantial way. And obviously, if we got a major inflation spike, that could that could tank the market in a major way, and SDAO would spike on that. But, you know, inflation spike, I don't see that being very realistic, okay? So the only things I think are really the most probable is if we got a serious bank or financial institution to go under. I think that's the one thing that could really spike this market big. Debt ceilings are p potential, but like I said, I just, I have trouble seeing the market actually freaking out over that, to be quite honest, okay? Now, another way you can play, there's a lot of different hedges you can play in the market if you're looking to hedge your portfolio, and I did a super in-depth 45-minute video on a bunch of different hedging strategies and super in-depth in the Prev Stock Group recently. If you want to apply for that, check out the uh, description area down there. But um, another way you could play it is you could just buy SH. SH is essentially working against the S&P 500. So on a daily basis, let's say S A, you know, let's say the S&P 500 goes um, down one percent, then SH should go up one percent. Okay, so that's another way you could play it. If you wanted to get a little more risky there, then you could obviously buy something like call options on SH. If you want to play it a little more. Um, dangerous or you could play it less dangerous by you know obviously if you funneled in less money that that's another way to play it okay so that's kind of the hedging situations that are going on out there and by the way i do own some sh as a hedge as well tapestry tpr this is my biggest dividend stock out there it's up very nice here today on their earnings up over eight percent this is my big dog it's paid me a lot of dividend money it's going to pay me a whole lot more dividend money it's given me some really nice gains 200 it's one of my just sneaky stocks that's done tremendous for me and i think it's going to pay us a lot more gains in the future they own coach Stuart weitzman kate spade and to be quite frank their earnings were phenomenal absolutely phenomenal i mean you know great beat on revenue, great beat on EPS. I was really, really happy with them. They just continue to execute on a very high level. And it's one of those stocks that I feel very comfortable being my largest position in my dividend only portfolio. It's not like I made it that. It's not like I tried to make Tapestry my biggest position in my dividend portfolio. It just became that, man. It, the gains are ridiculous, astronomical, and it pays me huge dividends. Because you got to understand, do the math on what, what Tapestry, somebody, somebody in the comments section, okay, that wants to do the math on this. Do the math on what Tapestry is paying for dividends on a yearly basis now at this point in time versus my cost basis and what dividend yield I'm getting based upon my cost basis. Somebody let me know in the comments section. That is going to be a large, large number, okay? So Tapestry absolutely loved them. Now, I thought this was interesting, right? This goes back to that debt ceiling talk we were talking about and, you know, if there was something that could tank the market it's it's a potential right this was i thought back page news but i thought this was interesting so how would the so-called calamity play out in the u.s housing market in a report published on thursday zillow's senior economist jeff tucker argues that mortgage rates could top eight percent if the u.s defaults on its debts which could happen as in early june that's crazy okay and so it kind of shows you the the severity of the situation we're dealing with here folks okay if we're talking about that happening, I mean, real estate, in my opinion, is already in a bad place. That would just be the cherry on top, okay? Then, if that was to happen, then the whole recession fears, oh boy, it becomes a lot more clear if that was to happen. So that's just, you know, important to understand the danger we're playing with in this game, folks. It's, it's, it's a no joke as holy smoke is. You know, think about that. Who's, who's out there going to, who's going to buy a house? If, who's even buying a house right now with 6% plus rates? Who's buying at 8% rates, folks? Who's doing it? We're done. We're done if that happens. Absolutely done. Cheesecake Factory. This is actually one easy money stock in my opinion right now. They came out with earnings here just a, a bit ago, and I'm very happy with their earnings. Okay, This isn't the main stock we're talking about that the, is the easy money stock, but Cheesecake Factory, love this one. Valuation is just extremely compelling, just a straight value dividend play in regards to this one. Their numbers were incredible, absolutely incredible. I posted this up in the Discord chat, going through their numbers essentially. My gosh, okay? 
So obviously their revenues grew substantially year over year from $793 million to $866 million of revenue, right? But in terms of food and beverage costs, they kept that in line, which is not easy to do in this environment, folks. Labor expense, they actually were able to bring that down as a percent of revenue. Oh, okay, that's really impressive. Other operating costs and expenses, they were able to keep that roughly in line, right? General uh, and administrative expenses, they were able to keep that in line. Depreciation and amortization kept that in line. And so look what happened to their income from operations, right? It went from 3.6% to 3.9%. But look at the dollar amount that that changes just by a small amount when you have your revenue go up and you have your percentage get a little better. I mean, you're talking about $5 million plus there in terms of income from operations going up. And look what happens to your net income. Your net income went from uh, basically 2.9% to 3.2% of revenue, right? To then now $28 million plus in net income from about $23 million. So almost $5 million up year over year as far as net income. And EPS was up even a more st substantial percentage. So my gosh, folks, I was very, very happy with these cake numbers. That's executing well. I felt like Texas Roadhouse was definitely beating them, which Texas Roadhouse is another stock I personally own in my, uh, my dividends-only account. I do own that in the Patreon portfolio, if I recall, as well. Um, but th th this was just, I was just thrilled with this, okay? And the beautiful thing with Cheesecake Factory is just last year, they brought back their dividend, okay? So basically, for every share I own, I get paid 27 cents every three months in, in just dividend money that comes in that I can go ahead and reinvest into other stocks. And I believe they're going to up this dividend substantially over this next few years. Substantially. Obviously, they'd cut it for a while there while they were going through Rona, which is natural. And so you, the, before Rona, remember, they were paying a 36 cent dividend. My opinion, they're going back there. And it'll probably happen within the next two years. And then ultimately, it's going to move to 40 cents, 50 cents, 60 cents, if not more per quarter, in my opinion, over this next few years. So I'm really, really thrilled with this. And last thing I want to cover in regards to Cheesecake Factory, they have a cash balance of $116 million. They have a revolving credit facility available at $239 million. The principal amount of debt outstanding was $475 million, so that I don't like, including $345 million in principal amount for con uh, convertible senior notes due 2026. So their balance sheet, not as good as a Texas Roadhouse. That's their weakness versus a Texas Roadhouse. No, they have bought some stock back here. They just bought uh, about 341,000 shares back. And I understand the stock's really cheap, so it kind of makes sense to buy this stock back. I would rather them use that money to build cash position right now or potentially even even pay down debt, do something like that. I, I, for right now, that's, that would be my preference rather than buy back shares. I understand it's cheap. I would just rather have them cash stack for now. There's already returning money to shareholders and paying the, the dividends, okay? So they're already doing that. So in my opinion, just stack money for now. Stack money, do, it, do that thing, okay? So that's my opinion there. Now, before we get into the easy money stock, this is for all my Vegas folks out there, okay? Now they're talking about building the new Oakland A's stadium, which will be the Las Vegas A's right here, okay? If you didn't hear, Tropicana, they might end up tearing down Tropicana right there and building the A's stadium right there for Vegas folks. And then from my understanding, they're talking about either tearing down Excalibur or building a new uh, resort right here. So I'm excited because that part of the strip is dated. Let's call it that, very dated. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hopefully that happening for my Vegas folks out there, okay? So... Obviously, last year, was, Meta was an easy money stock. It was such an obvious easy money stock, in my opinion. It was right in front of everybody's face, and no one wanted a piece of this stock, and it just made no sense, okay? That was last year. This year, we have a new easy money stock that's right in front of everybody's face, in my opinion, and it's very easy money, and I like this one a lot, okay? Don't, I don't own any shares right now, but I'm telling you, I'm going to probably own some shares pretty shortly here, okay? So stock I flirted with in the past, I owned in the past, then I sold out, wasn't really sure. Now I'm a lot more sure about this company, okay? It's PayPal. This stock is at a five-year low right now. This stock is down almost 19% where, from where it was five years ago. Now, why is a stock an easy money stock? It's got to be more than just, well, it's down from where it was five years ago. I'll show you exactly why, okay? First off, what, is, what has happened with their business over the past five years, right? Well, in 2018, right, which is what we're looking at here, they were doing about $15 billion of revenue roughly back then, okay? They're going to do about $30 billion of revenue this year, about $30 billion. So they've about 2 x their business from where the stock price was when it was actually higher than where it is now, which is incredible, absolutely incredible to think about. Now, on a valuation front, this stock is dirt cheap. 
I mean, it's incredibly dirt cheap, okay? They're trading at a, at a 2023 P ratio right now, uh, expected here, of about 12, in the 12 to 13 range. For PayPal, you've got to be, you've got to be flipping my flapjacks. That's ridiculous, okay? Absolutely astronomically ridiculous. And I honestly think they could come in with big beats. I listened to the conference call, and based upon what they were talking about there, I'm like, I think this business is set up to, to be in a much better position. And I think they're going to have their net income expand much more rapidly and their EPS much more rapidly than their revenue. So basically, whatever they bring in for revenue, especially for this next 12 months, I think it's going to be small percentage compared to how much their, their EPS and net income is going to skyrocket on a year-over-year basis. So if anything, I wouldn't be surprised if they, they're a year ahead where they do $5 something this year and then they end up doing $6 and some change next year, okay, which puts the valuation obviously substantially lower from here. So it's a crazy value proposition. Now you might say, well, has something happened with their business model where it deteriorated and they're like done? Nope, nope, and nope. Okay, we'll go into the numbers in just a moment. I'll show you that. But just looking at the Apple, this is the iOS Apple App Store, right? Number two and most, and number three most popular apps on the Apple App Store, PayPal and Venmo. If you didn't know, Venmo is also owned by PayPal. Okay, so they're in a phenomenal position. Only thing more popular is what Square owns, which is called Cash App. Okay. Android, same exact situation. This is in the United States of America, by the way, I'm showing you. And PayPal and Venmo are successful outside of the United States of America as well. I'm just showing you the U.S. market because that's the most important market for them, right? And uh, PayPal, number two. Venmo, number three, most popular on Android when it comes to the finance category, right? So their business is certainly not like deteriorated or gone away or something like that, right? Now, some people say Square stock is overvalued. I beg to differ. Square stock is actually valued properly right now. These sorts of companies should trade at forward P's in the 30s, okay? The market in general is going to trade at, say, an 18 to 20 forward P.E. roughly, somewhere in there, you know, maybe 15 if you're in a lower valued market at a particular time. So the fact that this stock's trading at a 30-something is, is valued properly. This, these sorts of business models should command that sort of valuation, right? Visa, for instance, which in my opinion is going to grow much less than PayPal over the coming years, Visa is valued at about a 27 forward P ratio, okay? Which I think is about right. That's, that's about right for Visa. I wouldn't say Visa is undervalued. I wouldn't say Visa is overvalued. I'd say that's fair. And so you got to understand when PayPal is trading at a forward P of 12, potentially 11, there's massive epic upside in the stock, okay? PayPal needs to go up between 100 and 150% over the next 12 to 18 months to be valued properly, okay? 100 to 150%. Stocks don't trade at silly valuations for too long. And right now, this stock is trading at an absolutely silly valuation. It should not be. And that will correct itself, as the stock prices always do correct themselves. You can only trade at silly valuations on a low side or high side for so long. And it breaks. And that's exactly what I see playing out here with PayPal. Now, the CEO is leaving the company at the end of this year. So right now they're looking for a new CEO for the company, right? And they're doing that search right now. This is an overhang on the stock right now. This is a big overhang. Once that is announced, and especially if Wall Street likes a new incoming CEO, the stock's going to pop 20, 30% in probably a month after like the, the new CEO is announced. And so when that happens, we'll have to see. But if Wall Street likes whoever they get here, and I think they'll be able to get somebody phenomenal. Because here's the deal, okay? They're going to be able to get a top talent person. Oh my gosh, okay. This is probably the most attractive job you could possibly get as a, as, a, as a potential CEO out there right now. And the reason being, PayPal stock price is so flipping flat check and low right now. If you know anything about valuing companies, you realize this stock is valued so low. The numbers are great that this company's reporting, which I'll show you in just a moment here. And so if you come in as a CEO and you get a big uh, options-based compensation package, which is what you're likely going to get, okay? Oh my gosh, you are set up to become a potential billionaire, even if you're not already a billionaire. You are set up to become a billionaire because I'm telling you, whatever the package is a CEO is going to get is going to be massive, especially in regards to options. And if this stock doubles up, triples up, quadruples up over the next three to five years, which probably can do once they become CEO, their options are going to go up so much, it's ridiculous. And you're getting the lead... Uh, you know, a great company with a super stable business model that has a lot of expansion opportunity, it's the perfect scenario. So wh whoever they get is going to be the most talented, talented person you could possibly imagine. 
I don't know anybody that wouldn't take this opportunity right now. On just the financial front alone, it's a game changer. Never mind that. Once you've been the Pay- PayPal CEO, you can go anywhere you want after that. I mean, it's just it's cake for you after that. But I'm telling you, the money you can make, I wouldn't be surprised if the, whoever this PayPal CEO that comes in, wouldn't be surprised if they end up making more than even CEOs like Tim Cook, Sasha Nadella, Jensen Huang, Lisa Su. I wouldn't be surprised if they make more than those CEOs over this next three to five years. Wouldn't be surprised at all. It is the perfect scenario. Take me, PayPal. I'll go be your CEO, man. Holy smokers, that's no jokers. Now, in regards to numbers for this company, tremendous. You, you, based upon the stock price, you think, oh, this has got to be horrible. This is the perfect scenario, okay? Their total payment volume was up 10% year over year. Net revenue is up 9% year over year. Operating margin was up 322 basis points. <gasps> you tell me your operating margin is up that much, and then you tell me your revenue is up that much, and I'm going to say your net income is going to skyrocket. Their net income was up a whopping 56% year over year. They, they outgrew their revenues in terms of net income by over 5x, almost a 6x. That's insanity. That's insanity. Their earnings per diluted share, obviously they're doing big buyback as well right now, right? Which we'll touch on in just a moment, was up 61% year over year, okay? That is amazing. That means they over 6 x their revenues in terms of how much their diluted EPS was up year over year. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. So you're telling me you're getting a dirt cheap valuation on a company. You're telling me you're going to attract likely uh, the most top tier CEO you could imagine. You're telling me this company's positioned phenomenal. There's nothing not to like here. Absolutely nothing not to like. And on top of that, folks, they're buying back shares left and right. And unlike Cheesecake Factory, where I'd rather have them just stack money right now, for PayPal, they need to buy every share in sight right now. They just bought 19 million shares of the stock in this past quarter. They need to get their hands on as many shares as they can this next three to six months before this baby really starts to skyrocket, in my opinion. Get your hands on as much as possible. That's an easy money stock, and that's why. That's PayPal. I appreciate everybody joining me, as always, folks. I put together a um, very in-depth 30-plus minute video. It's a workshop. I put this together a few nights ago, and you definitely want to check it out if you're somebody that makes over 100 k a year. This is investing in 2023 and beyond as somebody that's a higher income earner. Let's just call it that, somebody that's making $100,000. It should help you out tremendously. It's a free workshop. I'll have it as a pinned comment down there. Enjoy that. Learn lots. I appreciate everybody joining me, as always. Much love, and have a great day.